All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Corning Museum of Glass. How's everyone doing tonight? Woo, excellent, excellent. Well, I love all that enthusiasm, and we hope that the folks at home uh, watching from far and wide are also in a good mood tonight, because we have a very special guest artist with us this evening. Uh, Tom Moore is going to be making a beautiful uh, piece it's really kind of hard to describe exactly what it is, but it's lots of parts, lots of pieces. He's been hard at work over the last few days making a lot of parts and pieces, and we're going to be assembling it this evening into a beautiful, beautiful piece. So we can kind of see the image on the floor uh, there. The character is a uh, big collection of different parts. I'll talk a little bit more as we go along for that. But I'd love to start out with a little encouragement for our team. I'll go through and introduce everybody, but let's get a big round of applause for the team and Tom here tonight. Um, Tom has brought his own team with them here. We've got Sarah, Betty, Jonathan, and David. I'll tell you more about them as we go along. A big round of applause for the visiting team here tonight. We also have Dane, Michael, and Benjamin from the CMOG team. My name's Helen. I'm going to be narrating throughout the evening as well. So let's get a big round of applause for our CMOG team. We also have Brad on the camera, Amanda here answering questions online, and Kayla up in the uh, booth doing all the amazing AV work here tonight. So I hope we're all going to have a really wonderful evening together. Um, I do highly encourage questions throughout the evening as well. Uh, they always pop up, both online and here in person, and we'll do our best to answer those questions as we go along. So let's see, we, right now he's working on um, the bird portion of this uh, character. I'm going to pick this up just for a second for our audience here in town. Um, you can see what wonderful characters he works with. This is actually some really amazing things. He's been making all these little parts, and right now we're working on the bird section. Um, they already have the car and most of the other components and things, including this trick cup on the top. Those have already been completed and are sitting in our pickup box over here on the side of the stage. So uh, making a very complicated piece like this doesn't happen all in one day. It really does take a lot of effort, a lot of pre-planning. And uh, I highly suggest you check out Tom Moore's uh, website as well, see some of the other work that he has, um, because it all kind of fits within this um, fantastical design. Do you need your picture back? <laughs> all right, don't want to steal your design there. Um, so all of this is a combination of um, glass blowing and glass sculpting. You're going to see a lot of uh, torch work here tonight. The torches that we're using, these are high temperature torches, allow you to spot heat very specific areas on that um, object. And so most of what we're going to be working with is assemblage tonight, only because it only only have a limited time to actually make this piece this evening. So all of these parts um, can take weeks to develop all the different components. So right now Dave's uh, heating a one specific area, probably to uh, start to move that glass a little bit. Uh, again, I'm not exactly sure how it all comes together, but we'll have to see and learn together. So it's going to be really exciting. You're making the spout right now. Oh, it's okay. All right, so making the little spout on the side of this. Probably referring to this design quite a bit throughout the uh, process. Um, a complicated piece like this uh, definitely needs to have a game plan. <laughs> you can imagine you don't come into the shop and just wing something like this. So uh, we've actually been uh, watching them. They've been uh, kind of working in our back shop. You may or may not know we have a secret back shop in the back that allows us to have a small work area to make things off of our main uh, glass blowing stage. So they've been back there making all kinds of parts, and I'm pretty sure Tom brought a lot of these parts with them too, right? You, you did it all here? You brought some of the cane from Pittsburgh. All right, awesome. So uh, here, let's get this out of the way so you don't catch it on fire. So they did bring a few items from Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Glass Center, give them a shout out. Really fantastic um, place down, of obviously, in Pittsburgh. But they do a lot of uh, residencies and a lot of uh, workshops 
and uh, have rental space. So it's a really fantastic place if you're in the region. Check it out if you're down in that area. But making a spout, um, this is actually just a hot bit of glass pushed through the side wall. You can even see the bits of cane, the pattern getting, being pulled up into that spout slightly. But it's kind of a fun little magic trick for glass blowers to just poke a hole through the side with glass. And as you pull up, it creates a bit of a hollow space. So you get this really nice um, hollow spout form. Now, is, is this in general, all these things kind of functional? Is there an opening through all of it? So it's kind of one big giant trick cup? Is that what we're looking at? It's just one big joke, he says. <laughs> all right. So all of these different parts will be tied together with a little bit of, uh, I guess, relative functionality, not necessarily meaning to have a true function. So pulling on that spout just a little bit uh, to lengthen it out. As we're working, um, really glass blowing and glass making like this is really all depending on temperature. Now, if we get any one part too cold, it could start to thermally shock and crack. If it's too hot, it'll get really movable and really melty, and you can use that heat to help shape the glass. But with all these little details, you also will start to melt out your details. So with all of these different components and points and little pieces, there's going to be a delicate balance tonight to be able to keep this piece uh, from melting all those details out or from cracking little details as it's being built. So there's going to be a lot of torches and a lot of attention paid to all the different little parts as they build it. You can already see uh, it's got little marini for eyes on the side. A lot of his characters um, have a lot of very uh, per interesting personalities to them, having different eyes, different uh, hands, different faces, features. Uh, so they're really going to um, come together and they all have an a interesting life of their own. But as he's making this uh, particular piece, I'm actually going to come out in the audience a little bit and talk to you folks a little bit about Kane and Marini, because that's going to be uh, a main de decorating uh, thing that they've used for this particular piece. So a basic cane. Now, this is, again, something that he had to develop um, over the weeks prior to coming here. But a basic cane would just be a rod of glass. You take a blob, you pull it between two irons, and you create a rod of glass. You can embed color into the core of that rod to create just simple stripes made out of glass. Now, those simple stripes can be added to the outside of a bubble. You can make other cane with them. But they're basically a decorative um, object. So we've got some wood grain cane here. We've got some little crisscross reticello in the green bowl that you see down here on the end. Um, the, these pieces here in the middle, uh, the white and the purple, the red and white stripes on the top of that bowl, those are all ways of using cane. So if you can take those little individual canes and you use them to make other canes, you can make uh, either pick up all those little rods on the outside of a blob of glass, and then that's going to give you more of a cage effect. As you pull apart to make that cane, you twist. And so it creates this spiral around the outside of that individual cane, so you can get that cage effect. Other um, techniques are to create uh, like a center that has a bunch of cane, then you gather over top of it, and as you twist, it creates a helix in the center of that cane. Now, we could be here all night long talking about all the different possible designs that you can use to make cane, but um, he has made a wide variety of those, and you can see uh, a combination of straight cane, of, of helix cane, of cage cane, all of these um, on the surface of that vessel. So even the uh, little parts and pieces that he's uh, assembling together uh, there's like individual legs, there's like little ears, there's little feathers, there's all kinds of parts. And a lot of them have been made out of these little chunks of cane to get that highly uh, designed um, bits onto it. Now another thing that you can use cane for is to actually s slice the cane and get what we call marini. And so marini are a side profile of a rod of glass. And so the most simple one would just be a polka dot. 
right? You get a core of color, you pull it long, you slice it, you could just get a polka dot. So he's got a lot of eyeballs on this piece. Uh, I don't know how many in total there are. Uh, a lot, she says. Yeah, a lot of eyeballs. He uses a lot of eyes in his characters and his, his uh, work. But that could be um, maybe two or three colors layered up to create the iris and the white part and then the black part around her moving up um, and creating a bullseye effect of all of that different um, glass. So you can get really simple ones, or you can start getting more complicated by adding additional layers of glass. Is anyone familiar with Millefiore? Italian design, little flowers. So uh, that's just a buildup of colors in multiple layers, each one of those layers meaning to look like a little petal. Um, you can also make geometric patterns if you make square glass and continue to, to build those up. You can start to bundle individual canes together and then re-pull them. So you can get really complicated, really delicate designs just by in the layering process of all of these cane to create marini pulling them down to tiny, tiny elements. So uh, a lot of that prep work is what was necessary to be done before he even came into the hot shop uh, to create this amazing piece this evening. Any questions that we have about that so far? There's at least 21 eyes on this piece. So it's gonna have a good, good watch over us when it's finished, fantastic. That's one thing I did notice looking at um, the website for Tom, and I've, of course, been aware of his work for many, many years and watching the development of these pieces, and uh, it really amazes me how much detail is in each one of these pieces. Uh, it's, it's one thing to kind of blow out a big bubble, maybe put a few, few designs on it here and there, maybe even add one or two elements to it. That's complicated enough. But to develop a fairly, fairly complicated form like this really does think, take a lot of uh, preparation. So learning how to pull the cane and being able to pull it nice and even to get the thickness that you want for the com particular component that you're looking for can also be really tricky. And all of these pieces have uh, little spouts, they've got little arms, they've got little eyeballs. There's all these different parts that come together. So uh, he's probably, I saw a picture today actually of his studio or him standing in what I think is a studio of his, and uh, it was just full of all these little parts and pieces and characters. So I can just imagine what fun it is to collect all these little things and kind of move them around and see which ones look good together and start working with different color palettes. Um, so really unlimited possibilities, especially when using all of that uh, cane and marini. So in addition to our furnace, we are not going to be doing a whole lot of gathering out of our furnace tonight because they do have most of these components and pieces already uh, assembled. But our furnace does uh, hold about 1,000 pounds of clear glass here at the studio. And that's melting at 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about 1150 Celsius. So coming fresh from the furnace, it's really hot and molten. We saw how easily it moved using uh, that spout at the very beginning. Uh, a little bit of hot glass can um, do some really fun things. But when the glass is remelted or softened, um, you can also continue to shape it. So right now, he's heating up the very end of this to do what I think is a little tail. And I'll apologize in advance if I name the wrong things, because there's so many little parts on there, I might not be able to identify them properly. But to me, it looked like a little bit of a tail being pulled out of the back end. It's, again, a bird that he's working on. And so he's also using uh, a set of crimps. Now, I always say that working with glass is kind of like working with hot Play-Doh. So you can get all kinds of texturing tools. You can take bits and pieces and push them together and mix and match them. But anytime you impart texture onto that soft material, it's going to keep that texture. Now, the key to success as well is to not get the texture too hot again. Otherwise, you'll just melt it right out. But these little crimp tools that he used, uh, one of my favorites, is actually called a fan tool. And so it has little tines that go at a fan style, and you can crimp on the side of that bit of glass to create that fan texture. But when creating texture, it's kind of unlimited on to what it could be. You could use that same crimp to create a fin or a feather. 
You can create a, a flower petal out of that. You can use it to squeeze around and maybe make texture on the grass or uh, really any number of uh, designs. So it's really into the artist's vision of what he wants to communicate, he or she wants to communicate on how they're reading those textures and how they translate into the piece. So again, we want to welcome all the folks online as well. So it's really exciting for us. Every Thursday uh, this summer, we've been doing these live stream demonstrations. And so all around the world, we have people tuning in uh, as long as they can be awake at the 6 o'clock on a Thursday. Um, they, they've been able to tune in and watch these demonstrations. Uh, sometimes we bring in artists who are teaching next door at the studio. Sometimes we feature some of the artists who work here at the museum, um, our CMOG team. And then sometimes we just get special artists that stop by and say, hey, I'm going to come into town. Let's make something exciting and fun. So Tom contacted us and uh, it decided to uh, come and visit and make one of these pieces for us. So we're really excited to have him with us this evening. Looks like we're going to transfer this um, off of that blowpipe and uh, start moving around a different direction. Now, for those of you who have seen uh, our regular demonstrations, you know that normally in a blown vessel, uh, you finish bottom half of something, then you put a punty onto it, transferring it over to the other direction, and then you can finish off the top half. So it's generally about halfway through the process, you flip that from one direction to the other. But when you're looking at sculptural pieces, um, they don't always have a uh, even Steven flip and flop. You may end up punting it on the side. You may end up punting it kind of at a weird three-quarter angle. You could go end to end, but it really depends on, one, how you want to heat that glass. Because one, uh, whatever's furthest away from you, you can get the hottest while keeping what's close to you a little more stable. Or you want to have it so that it fits into that reheating chamber. If you make something really tall and you somehow punt it on its side, it may not fit back into that hole. And everything needs to be able to fit into that reheating chamber throughout the working process. So uh, as big as this gets, if he starts getting bigger than the biggest door of our reheating chamber, he's going to run into trouble. So we would need to make sure that everything is at the right angle to make that happen. There's also tons of different styles of punties. And each uh, gaffer uh, kind of gravitates to their own style and design. But beautiful job. Good transfer there. Let's give a big round of applause, shall we? Yeah. Fantastic. Actually, I'm going to encourage you in general to just throw, throw out the love and enthusiasm anytime you feel it throughout the rest of the evening, all right? It helps keep our energy up. It helps keep the gaffers going. And it also, uh, of course, lets us know that you're enjoying the show. So now that they've got this flipped around, uh, they'll start to focus heat on the other end uh, of this piece uh, to be able to shape up the rest of it. Now, I did say that a lot of the parts that they've already made are sitting in the oven here. Our pickup boxes um, are great glass babysitters, and we're very grateful for them because if we had 100 different parts that we couldn't put down somewhere, that means we'd need 100 different people to be flashing and keeping those parts warm. But instead, we can make all these parts, put them into one of these um, glass babysitters, and then everything stays safe, warm, and happy in there. So we can continue to make more parts and put them in the box. And as you build all those different parts and they're all safe in there, then you can start to assemble them together at one time. The team has been working together here uh, for the last couple days, making all of these little parts. And uh, it really has been a fascinating thing to watch. Yes, you got a question, sir. Yeah, what temperature we keep stuff in the hot box? Um, right now, it's sitting at about uh, 1,050 degrees. Um, we want to say we've got liquid glass at 2,000. At 1,000 degrees, it's pretty much stable. It's not going to move around at all. Um, but if we go too much below that temperature, the glass can start to crack. So as the glass, at least our type of glass, we're using a soda lime glass, as that glass cools, it shrinks just a little bit. 
So thick and thin, they would shrink at different rates as they cooled naturally, and that would cause stress in the piece, causing it to crack fairly quickly. So we're sitting at a temperature that's just barely above that danger point, but not quite to a point where it starts to move or change shape. They've worked really hard to make a lot of really amazing little components, so we don't want to melt them all down into a puddle. We also run the risk that if that glass were to get too hot, they are sitting on various ceramic shelves right now, and hot things stick to hot things. So eventually, those parts would start to melt, they'd start to stick to those shelves, and then we wouldn't be able to even get them out of there. So yes, it's a delicate balance of keeping things at just the right temperature. And probably when they start to assemble a lot of these things, they bump it up a little hotter just to get it a little closer to that movement point so that they can grab them out. And there'll probably be a few moments where we need to just hang out and wait a little bit while the oven recovers its temperature a little bit so that nothing got too cold as we're opening and closing those doors. But great question. Um, in addition to the uh, pickup box, we also have what's called a garage. And a garage is gas-fired. The oven that we're using there is all electric. But the gas-fired oven, we don't have it on right now because they don't need it, but uh, it has kind of a hot side and a cold side. So instead of having to bump that temperature up, you can store things in the somewhat cold side and then tuck them over to the hot side, putting them over the flame itself before you come out to introduce it to the piece. So it's another great tool to help um, build, build up temperature and to store pieces to be able to uh, accumulate a lot of parts. All right, oh, look at that adorable face on there. I love it. So I believe this is going to be the neck of that bird. So um, there's a lot of moments in glass where it kind of looks ridiculous before it turns into itself. So you got to kind of pre-plan. You got to understand that, well, if I put heat here and I yank it on this other area, it's going to start moving in one area and maybe not another area. So to get really smooth transitions and curves onto the neck of this bird, um, it's kind of coaxing it into place, making sure that the temperatures are just right. The tip of that little long piece is probably going to be the hottest, and the area near the body would be a little bit colder or maybe thicker. So sometimes we're actually cooling the glass in order to get it to be hot to pull in the right place. So you'll see a lot of playback and forth with temperature and uh, heating and cooling and being able to uh, create the shape that we want. The addition of these torches is really uh, a very important step forward in the, the glass world. Um, the particular, the big fluffy one we call it, um, that, that one actually is mostly just to keep things warm. It's not really going to get things hot enough to truly melt them, so it's really more of an insurance policy. You're going to see them focusing a lot of heat with that torch, maybe on the delicate parts, maybe on uh, areas they want to move, just to get a little bit of heat. But then we also have um, the very, very hot torch. That's what they're using right now. I think this might be another eyeball or maybe, yeah, OK. <laughs> 27 eyeballs, I think she said. So it's going to be a lot of eyeballs. And this is a pretty, pretty uh, slick little trick. So he took a bit of cane, that's that solid rod, and he heated just the end and used it like a little punty. So got it hot with the torch, went and picked up that little eyeball out of the oven while it was staying warm and happy, and then stuck it onto the piece nice and warm and then just kind of wiggled that cane and it broke free. So just like a punty that we add to the piece itself, we can use glass uh, rods to do the same kind of thing creating a weakness between those two so that hopefully it breaks nice and cleanly and we get the eyeball attached to the side of the piece. All right, any other questions so far? Yes. Yeah, the big platter down there. We always get a lot of questions about this particular design. This is what's called reticello. And this is another complicated thing that takes a lot of prep work, um, but it's also using cane. 
So you pull rods of, of cane, lots of cane. It takes lots of cane to do medicello. And you want them all to match. You want them all to be the same size. Now we use different colors. We can use all the different size. You take those individual canes and you lay them out um, like a bunch of pencils laid out on a ceramic shelf. Once you have them on that shelf, you can warm that shelf up. That warms up the canes just enough so that they stick together. They just fuse together. That essentially creates a sheet of cane. He has also done very similar techniques in using that cane to make these objects as well. So you create that sheet of cane, and then you roll that sheet up into a tube on the end of a pipe. And if you take that tube and you seal off one end, that's essentially giving you a bubble. So you take one set of cane and you pick it up and you twist it one direction and you make a little cup out of it. Now it's not a drinking cup, it's just a vessel cup shape, uh, kind of like our rainbow cup here. So it's just a, a component. So you got one that spirals one direction. Then you pick up a whole other set of cane that has the same numbers and you twist them the other direction. And while it's still in bubble form, you jam one inside of the other, and so when you pick up that cup, you do a stuff cup, um, you get that crisscross effect. But the key to success for this one is that as you're making those two cups, you've got to keep texture in those canes. Because you can see even my fingers, it's got little negative spaces, right? So if you crisscross two textural pieces over top of each other, where they crisscross, they trap little air bubbles. So you get these little tiny air bubbles in between each little crisscross. And if you get air bubbles from tip to tip, you've done the process correctly. Most of the time, it doesn't work that well. So that is a really challenging process um, to work with. Um, but yes, you can use that to make any number of designs and any number of pieces, and it becomes one of those glass blower challenges. Speaking of challenges, look at this beautiful curve they've got there now on the top of that bird. So really pulling out that neck, and it looks like it, it moved really nicely. You can see what a beautiful straight taper he has on that, um, that neck. That really shows his understanding of glass, the temperature of how it's going to move, and being able to get a really nice curve. All right, so we had a question online uh, about Tom Moore, and he's been working with glass since 1991. Now, he is an Australian um, glass worker uh, based in Adelaide of South Australia, and currently working very closely uh, with the Jam Factory. He was once the production manager from 1999 to 2015, but using their glass facilities as well as his own home studio to make a lot of his amazing work. The Jam Factory is another public access studio, very similar to um, the one that we have here, uh, where they teach classes and workshops and they rent time to professional artists. Uh, a lot of times artists very rarely own their own studios, at least in the beginning. So it's really important to have these public access studios to allow artists to, one, train and learn and, and kind of practice, but also just to have access to a studio to make the work that they want to make. So, was that our only question online? Okay, thanks. Yeah, keep them coming. We'll do our best to answer as we go along. So it looks to me like maybe we've got another punty started up. I have a feeling this piece is going to be transferred many, many times in the working of this object. Um, and that's a really tricky thing to do. There's always a delicate balance of temperatures. You got to make sure the glass is just the right temperature to get it to survive. Uh, it has to be cold enough to actually crack, but trying to focus those cracks only where you want them and not where you do not want them. 
Another beautiful transfer. Very nice. Now, I think this is also going to be an amazing piece to be seen from the inside of that reheating chamber tonight. Uh, obviously, we have a 2,100 degree furnace, and the camera is actually located behind that furnace, and there's a very special window that separates the camera from the intense heat of that furnace. It's called fused silica. But the exciting thing is, is that we get that inside look to uh, that reheating chamber. And when you're doing characters like this, there's always some really entertaining moments on that visual from the inside of that furnace. All right, so we had another question online about the tools. And as you can see, or maybe you can't see from home actually, but they've got a tool bench, they've got a secondary bench, they've got pretty much a huge collection of toys to play with here tonight. And uh, I'm sure there's a few of them have been personal handmade tools. He might have made some of them himself. Uh, some of them are made uh, by manufacturers, but it's a very small kind of cottage industry. So I like to say the tools themselves are actually, ooh, Nice. The tools themselves are actually um, a piece of art in their own right. There's only a limited demand for glass making. As many glass makers as it feels like there are in the world, we're a pretty small population. So a lot of the tools are handmade. This looks like maybe a, a pickle grabber or something from Victorian era. These are amazing. So uh, he's got little claws on them. Can you guys see this? These little grab maybe an egg grabber. I'm not really sure what those were intentionally made for. Um, but this is one of my favorite things. You go to the hardware store, you go to the restore, you go to the Goodwill, wherever you find used things, and you just look through the piles of stuff that people are getting rid of, and you think, ah, I, I like the texture of that. And I bet if I push that texture into the soft glass, I'll get some really interesting designs. Or, okay, well, I need to make this weird shape and I need to be able to grab hold of it to be able to stick it onto my piece and sometimes the tweezers themselves, a two-point contact is not going to cut it. You're going to end up dropping that piece. So uh, the tong business has really been booming lately with glassmakers kind of developing all these different tongs that can hold things either in a tripod effect or maybe I saw earlier he was using ones that kind of went really wide and came in at two little points from um, from kind of far to the side of the piece. So yeah, the tool making is definitely a challenge, but I think carrying of the tool bag becomes one of the biggest challenges too, because we all really love our toys. And it's really unlimited um, on to what those possibilities are. But uh, I don't know the specifics to answer the specific companies that he's working for. It looks like he's got a lot of custom tools. He's got a lot of our tools out as well. So um, we've just given him the toy box tonight and he's kind of pulling out all the stops uh, to make this happen. Yes. I'm sorry, let me come up a little closer. I can't quite hear you. Yeah, what kind of metal do we use for the tools? Yeah, you know what? Um, I've seen all kinds of tools, and most of them are some sort of tool steel or standard steel. Um, you can make copper tools, but they tend to heat up really quickly. So generally, if you're using a, top, a copper tube or something, you might wrap some tape or something around it to just keep it a little easier to hold on to. Porcelain tools? Uh, I'm not as familiar with too many porcelain tools, but I have made um, tools out of clay and dried them and fired them. Um, you'd have to put a kiln release on them to keep them from sticking because the ceramic does have a ten it's very porous, so it has a tendency to stick as soon as it gets hot. Really, any of these tools, if they get too hot, they will start to stick to the glass. Um, but I have made plaster tools, so you could make um, positives and then pour or pour plaster in there to create a, a positive with a certain texture, and you can push that into the glass. 
Now, those tools aren't going to last very long. <laughs> you know, heat will degrade things very quickly. Um, but you can definitely make tools out of wood, plaster, metal, pretty much anything that's not toxic when it burns. And honestly, there are some um, toxic tools out there, too, that uh, people have started to use um, these certain jacks that open up vessels that are made of Teflon and oh, terrible, terrible stuff. But um, there's a lot of tools. You're really unlimited. Uh, it's just whether that tool will actually survive a long process of working with it. So like the plaster, of course, would be a limited use. Wooden molds would be a limited use. If you're wanting more longevity out of that tool, then you're going to gravitate towards uh, the metal, the cast iron, the aluminum. Um, we have aluminum, we have bronze and brass, so uh, any number of things. I think glass makers are very resourceful in that way. Um, that again, if you can't find it, you might have to make it, and then you might only have access to certain things to be able to make that tool, so you kind of make it work uh, however you can. I've also seen a lot of augmentation of tools. So just going to the hardware store and getting a pair of tin snips and like shaving off part of it to make it a thinner blade and stuff like that. So you can also um, re-acclimate uh, um, certain tools for that purpose. Speaking of re-acclimation of parts for our purpose, the torch that uh, David's using right now is actually a torch that was originally designed for the flame working community. Oh, I think here comes the first leg. He's got a little leg with his feet. So that torch is usually mounted onto a table, and then you introduce rods and tubing into that torch to create a, an amazing array of objects. Um, but we, as glassmakers in the hot shop, I think got a little jealous about the ability for it to spot heat so intensely that we pulled that out of, uh, off the table and have put handles on them, starting to augment those tools for our purposes. So uh, all of these different handle styles, you can get longer and shorter, and uh, everybody kind of customizes their torch. But you can see what an amazing um, ability these torches have to intensely heat very specific areas. Um, if you wanted to attach this leg and you didn't have a torch, what you would have to do is take a blob of fresh hot glass and use that like glue. So you could take that blob of glass and you put it onto the end and then you squish it in there and it'll stick, no problem. You've got this nice connection, but uh, it's kind of like hamburger patties. You know, you, you got this blob that's unnecessary in your design and trying to incorporate it into the design, it gets a little awkward. So being able to spot heat specific areas, touching them together, even heating in those transitions, you can see the bubble right now is giving under the pressure of him pushing that leg, and then he pulls it back a little bit to kind of reseed it. So it's got a really nice contact point um, and transition from one part to another. It looks like we got two different kinds of feet on there, too. I love it. Now, we did have some uh, questions online a little bit about his inspiration. So I'm going to take this opportunity. I know uh, Tom said he was touch and go weather to show this, but he's put together a really nice uh, slideshow. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into uh, this slideshow and just show you some of the images um, from his work. Uh, and the, sec the first part is a video. The second part is uh, images of his actual work. And then the third part is inspirational things that he has found here at the museum that help influence his work. And um, I have not gotten a chance to see all these slides. It was just put together, so I'm sorry I don't have a lot of information about it, but I think it'll give us a better perspective on the kinds of things that he's looking at uh, for this piece. All right, so this first video that we are playing is part uh, was projected on the outside of the building of this South Australian Museum. I know it had a video action. I don't know how, if that plays or not there, Kayla. Oh, I guess I needed to activate it. Okay, there we go. My fault. 
So if you look really carefully at some of these images, you can see um, like the little chunks of cane that are growing up into the upper section. You can see some little eyeballs and, and uh, different falling qualities. So there's a lot of little components here that look like they're direct images from the work that he actually makes and all the little parts that he makes. Now, he said it was like a two-minute video, and he didn't want me to play the whole thing, so I'm going to go ahead and move on uh, beyond that because we also want to make sure we get some good action shots of all this uh, piece coming together. So I'm just going to scroll through these uh, fairly quickly, um, and then if Tom wants to come back to them and talk about them a little bit more, we might have time later. But as you can see, uh, we've got some really fantastical characters. I love this guy, the little shark. Um, and I'm also going to read a quote from his uh, website here. Um, his fantastical world embraces gorgeous birds and animals that have already hybridized with modern automobiles and airplanes as is, and is inhabited by exquisite creatures that are morphing uh, to inhabit a universe that seems quite as ominous as it is beautiful. So again, a great sense of play, lots of wonderful components and characters. Uh, again, that repetition of um, common themes of the animals and the industry, uh, the eyeballs, and some really fun clear objects. I can see a lot of influence of some of the trick glasses and things that we have in our collection, which I believe are part of his um, conversation. Looks like in the le upper left corner there is an ancient piece with the cage. I don't know if that's kind of a deer or a horse or something. I'm not sure what the original one was from. Um, also, uh, a, assembling these together with other mixed media materials to give them certain atmospheres and homes. I love this guy too, the little flame on his back. You can even see the, the little joints of the legs have those same kind of little eyeballs along the surface. But what a lot of personality into each one of, of these little characters. Oh, that guy's awesome. Now, the piece that we're doing tonight will have an automobile added to it as well. They made that a little bit earlier, so it's a combination of those uh, animals and automobiles. You can also see a lot of use of that cane. Every single element of these pieces has a decorative pattern on it of some sort. Uh, of course, uh, each one of those being made separately, developing the designs in the, of the particular cane or Marini style. Looks like a little reticello there on the bottom half. And some of the sketches in the background of this picture really gives you an inside look onto some of that design process as well. And again, you'll definitely want to uh, check out his website, Tom Moore. Uh, I did a search, Tom Moore Glass. You can find him right there on the internet. Look a little, take a little more time to look at some of these amazing pieces. Now, Tom did study glass. He got a BFA from Canberra School of Art in ANU. Uh, is about 99.9% .9 finished with his uh, PhD at the University of, of Australia, just waiting for those final uh, check marks to be checked as all the work has been submitted. So we'll be a PhD uh, graduate here momentarily. And then as promised, the Corning Museum of Glass of course has an extensive collection, so he also included a few images of the historical pieces uh, that he references um, when making this kind of work.
So you can see a sim similar sense of whimsy. Most of these had a certain function as well, but had a lot of uh, uh, reminiscent of particular animals using traditional techniques like cane making. Beautiful pieces. If you want to see any of these pieces a little closer, you, of course, can come here to the Corning Museum of Glass. We've got a lot of um, pieces in, in our collection to look at and study. You can also reference a lot of things online as well. So if you are uh, not in the area specifically, you can definitely check out and do some searches for uh, trick glasses and other historical references through our uh, search engines there on the website. And that's back to the beginning. All right, thank you, Kayla. Thanks so much. All right, so hopefully that gives you a little better perspective onto a little bit of the background of what you're excited about. All right, so it looks like we've got uh, four legs now. We've done, been doing a lot of work while we were looking at images. And once he's added all these pieces together, he's gotten a little bit of warmth so that they can all kind of be tweaked into the final position. Um, sometimes it's really difficult to, again, find that balance of temperature where things are moving but not melting uh, or not kind of affecting the sidewalls. I'm just guessing that this kind of uh, assemblage took a lot of trial and error trying to learn how to what thicknesses were necessary on the bird body so that it didn't collapse while you were putting on all the different components, having enough structure, uh, all the little details in those feet and everything, uh, those thin, delicate parts. But as you can see, he's been working with uh, glass uh, for many, many years, and has probably done a wide variety of experimentation. Any other questions I can answer so far? All right, so it sounds like we've got 160 people tuning in from all around the world here online. So thank you again for tuning in. It's like we're using some kiln shelf here. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we can use those same kiln shelves to warm up the canes, and when they're hot, things will stick. But uh, it's a really great tool to be able to help shape glass. I want to make sure that uh, it sits nice and flat. Are you picking up the car? All right, so now we've got a really big pipe and a lot of glass making a really nice uh, punty. This will be the punty that the entire piece gets built onto. So um, I was watching earlier when they were making the car in the back, and the car is pretty much solid glass. So it's all layers of cane squished flat, and then blobs of glass added to it to create dimension, and then lines drawn onto it to create that form. So uh, by the time you accumulate all of these different parts together, that's a lot of weight. It's a lot of solid glass. So uh, we want to make sure that this punny is um, strong enough to support all of that weight. You might notice it's even a fatter diameter of pipe. So uh, it's really important to be size appropriate with the, the pieces that you're making. Because you're kind of limited only by a few things here in the shop. Um, one, you got to make sure the piece is uh, able to fit into that hole the entire time you're working. You need to make sure that the people can carry that piece around. So ergonomically, a, more, a thicker pipe can support more weight and be more ergonomic to be able to turn it. Especially on a sculpture like this, it's not going to be evenly balanced, like blowing out a tall vessel or something. You're going to constantly be a little off balance. 
so having the ability to really turn that pipe and get the torque when it's getting a little off center um, is really important. So they're doing, I think what I saw was more of a sculpture punny. C more crown punny? Okay. That's beautiful. 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 So crown punny is, uh, you kind of pinch it around the outside so it almost creates like a little donut, but it looks like a little crown because it's got little points. So this will actually contact on a lot of little points rather than being solidly contacted. And then they might even cut in a jack line. Now we did a jack line on most of our pieces. We didn't really see it too much on the sculpture because they've already had made a lot of these pieces. Um, but we're gonna make sure that this piece is connected solidly, but also has a weakness to get it to break free. So there's our little car. Well, big car, actually. You can see all the stripes of cane in the bottom. Beautiful job. And it's a critical thing, picking up out of that box. You want to make sure your punny is stable enough uh, so that when you go to pick it up, all that weight doesn't flop around so much. Um, but if it's too cold, it won't stick properly. So uh, delicate balance. But now we've got our car. And I was able to walk back again and see some of this being made. And one of my favorite things is the wings on the back. Anybody remember those old cars with the big fins on the back of them? So if you look closely, the back end of this car has some of those little fast-moving wings on the back. Yeah, nice, nice camera work there. So the car is just the base, uh, and the bird will be put onto the top of that car. And then on top of the bird goes a lot of other parts as well. So we're really starting to accumulate all of the individual pieces that they've been working really hard on over the last couple of days. Now, as we're working, we need to make sure that nothing gets too cold. So they're going to do a lot of swapping back and forth, reheating that glass, finding that perfect balance using the torch to spot heat the bottom of these feet. We want to make sure that it sticks together but not move that shape too much. Uh, so really finding um, a delicate balance. Now, if you've watched uh, a couple of artists who have worked together for many, many years, um, they may not talk that much. But in a piece like this, even though he's worked with these folks quite often, uh, there's still a lot of communication that needs to take place. But if it was a bunch of uh, newbies that didn't really know what they're doing, that conversation would be completely different. So it really is um, the best assistants are also the best gaffers themselves. And so they are really anticipating the needs of Tom as they're building this piece. Um, he just needs to kind of tell them a, a sense of timing or, or uh, exactly what he wants at a certain um, part in the construction of this piece. Um, but all of these artists have been working with glass for many, many years. So they themselves have that sense of timing already developed. As they're building this piece, I actually um, asked them before uh, this evening, um, to give me just a few details about them so I could give them a little highlight um, here this evening because skilled assistants are definitely hard to come by and, and these are a really great team that Tom has assembled here today. So we've got uh, Sarah Vaughn. She's holding on to the bird right now. Uh, she did receive her BFA from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. It's where I happened to uh, go for graduate school as well, so I kind of knew her back in the day. Um, has an MFA from I RIT um, and is currently working at the Chrysler Museum um, in Norfolk, Virginia and teaches for the Governor's School. And her fun fact is she loves rocks. So I didn't get an explanation for that of whether it was you like climbing rocks or you just love rocks or the geology of it all. 
make the ri make rocks. All right. Sorry, I went totally distracted her at a key point there. So she loves to make rocks. So a lot of her work uh, includes rocks. Now uh, Betty uh, Gowan, she is uh, kind of backing up Tom on the pipe there, making sure that uh, it can stabilize that pipe as necessary. She has a BFA from Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, a former Chrysler studio assistant, but still works in Norfolk. And her favorite animals are bats and manatees. This is some really awesome animals to be inspired by. Oh, we're getting a really good look at that car now. I love how he's used uh, the eyeballs for the lights in the front and the back. Again, uh, I think 27 or 29. Does anybody remember how many eyeballs we said? 21. Oh, I'm way overestimating. 21. I'm terrible with numbers. So 21 eyeballs uh, hidden throughout this entire piece. So uh, we'll have to see how many we can count. Now, this finished piece will be put up. An image of it will be put up online. So you can uh, follow up uh, with our social media here within... Uh, the next couple days. It'll probably take a couple days to get up onto the website and to the Instagram and all those uh, social medias, but they will eventually uh, be up there for you to see. What's that? It looks funny? In a good way? I agree. Absolutely. These pieces are amazing. I really love that sense of play that you put into this work here, Tom. I also feel like this work is a really wonderful example of how uh, we're looking at 4,000 years of glass making history and bringing into more of a contemporary conversation and really pushing it beyond those classical uh, approaches of glass and making unique items that really speak to the artist who is making them. So this has a lot of personality and uh, love and dedication in this work uh, really showing through, and really unusual approaches to using that classical techniques like, uh, of course, traditional blown glass and sculpture and the use of cane and marini, uh, really tying it all together. And we also have uh, David King here. He's the one holding the torch right now. His, uh, he says his favorite color is purple. Favorite material is glass. I know he likes uh, making bottles out of glass and uh, also doing a bit of cold working, uh, doing some really wonderful bottles, perforating the surface, creating some really unusual textures. And uh, he currently lives in Philadelphia, but will be work, uh, moving to Kentucky this fall uh, to be working at Center College. So we're really excited uh, to see this next movement forward for David and uh, all the things that are going to happen there in Kentucky. And then with the uh, hot job over here, we've got Jonathan uh, Bolivar. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Uh, started working glass at Tulsa Glass Blowing, at the Tulsa Glass Blowing School in Tulsa. Working as a tech apprentice at the Pittsburgh Glass Center. So again, if you have any questions about Pittsburgh, you can definitely uh, grab him while he's here today. Wonderful organization and uh, public access studio. Uh, loves drinkware and glasses used for functional dishware, so uh, really um, uh, inspired by tradition and functionality. But he also wanted me to mention that uh, he is getting married in a month to Danielle, yes. And wanted to make sure that Danielle got a really special shout out because uh, she's at home taking care of the animals and uh, wanted to let her know how grateful he is that he gets a chance to go and play with glass and be involved in these kind of projects. So congratulations to both of them on their upcoming nuptials. Yeah. All right, I think we're getting pretty close to the uh, assemblage of the bird to the car.
We call that a dry run right there. Just a trial size comparison, making sure that everything was just right, and then faked us out and went back for another reheat. That is, really shows the dedication of this team. It really shows the expert of this team. Uh, maybe someone less experienced would just rush through it and try to jam it on there, and maybe all the conditions weren't right, and then it wouldn't work out properly. But they started to recognize certain things that weren't quite lined up right, and so they, they knew they needed to go back in, do a little tweaking, and then um, reassemble that piece um, when all the conditions were just right. One of the hard things when you get glass hot is it starts to move. So of course, all those little toes are starting to reach outwards as they accumulate around, spinning in the heat. Subtle movements to push that onto place. Beautiful job. Very nicely done. I don't know about you folks, but I was holding my breath just a little bit when that was coming together. You kind of never know if it's all going to work well. Now, of course, under the experience of uh, gaffers like this, though, generally it goes pretty smoothly. Um, but there's always these moments where once you've contacted, there's no going back. You can't kind of take them apart very easily. So uh, all of that preparation, all that time that you spent in developing the heat, developing the shape, uh, making sure everything was just right, it all accumulates into that final moment. And it's make it or break it during those final moments. Any questions that have developed out here in our audience? I'm going to come out there so I can uh, hear you a little bit better. All right, what can I answer? Yeah, the car is assembled from solid glass. And if you look really carefully, you can see a lot of stripes on it. So part of it was canes that were melted together to create little sheets of glass. And then they put solid blobs onto it. So like where the windows are on their top, that's a solid blob of clear glass. And then the other blobs are sort of, um, or the sheets of glass were kind of cladding on the outside of that clear glass to create the, the rooftop and the side uh, panels of the car. And then the belly of the car, the underside of the car, has all these wonderful cane stripes on it as well. And I'm really uh, excited to see that he used clear glass because it's reflecting all of that color up into all that solid clear glass. How much does it weigh? Uh, probably feels like hundreds of pounds right now, but I would assume it's only maybe 20 pounds, give or take. Um, I haven't picked it up, so I'm not really sure. It always feels heavier, though, because it's right now it's on the end of a four-foot pole. So whatever weight you have, it doubles for every foot past center. So it feels heavier and heavier the further away from that glass you are. Yeah, you're welcome. Ah, how was Tom able to suspend the bubbles in the car? Like the little teeny bubbles that you see? This is a funny story, actually. I watched this earlier. Now, you can have um, bubbles added into glass purposely, or they can happen by accident. So if you're gathering glass uh, out of our furnace, it's all fluid. But when we fill that glass furnace, it's all little pieces that get filled up and as they melt. So they can trap little air bubbles inside that glass. Eventually, they'll work their way to the center and pop, or work their way to the surface and pop. But sometimes they're just trapped in there. So when you go to gather, you can either um, pull them out on accident, or uh, you can create bubbles by maybe spinning too fast and glass laps on itself. So you'll have little bits of glass. 
So there were a few bubbles trapped into some of this glass, but then he's like, well, I like those bubbles. So he actually took and poked the surface of the first layer of glass to create more negative spaces. And then when you gather over that, the glass doesn't fill in the nooks and crannies of those pokes. It actually creates more bubbles. So he created three layers of bubbles because he kept poking every layer as he gathered up more and more glass to create all these little tiny bubbles trapped in that solid glass. So it's a fun little design in there, isn't it? Yeah, so you can um, uh, really use that as a creative approach, as a decorative approach. But you can also look at um, bubbles in glass for historical reference to understand how a piece was made. So if you think of a bubble and it's trapped in the side of a piece, well, if I take that bubble and I blow the, bubble, the, the larger glass bubble out, that little tiny bubble will stretch and flatten. So it'll become wider. If that bubble is gotten hot and swung, then that bubble inside, the little teeny bubble, will actually stretch. And so you'll get like a long line out of that same bubble. Or you can see if that bubble kind of striates to the side, well, you know that it was twisted at some point. So you can kind of look at these little purposeful or accidental um, things in the glass, whether it's little bits of color or little bubbles, and you can kind of understand how that glass piece had been assembled or moved um, based on looking at those little things. So as you make your way through the museum or if you're looking online, uh, it might be a fun thing to kind of think about. Look at the little imperfections in that glass and see if you can figure out, well, was it stretched? Was it blown? Was it twisted? And be able to kind of figure out how that was made without having documentation on that fact. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, so we just had a question online. How hot is the glass when you're working on it? Um, now, I will say that uh, that partly depends on the type of glass that you're working. Some glasses, like borosilicate, you need to work a lot hotter to get it to, to go float fluid. And some glasses will set up very quickly. But our glass really works in a range of um, at 1,000 degrees or 1,100 degrees, it's not moving. At 2,100 degrees, it's fluid like honey. So we're really looking in upper ranges, I would say about 14 to 18 um, for most of the things that we're doing here to manipulate this class. Yeah, great question online. Any other questions here in the audience? Yes. Yeah, very popular question. She notices no one is really wearing gloves. So why is it so dangerous to, to, have, um, to be handling that glass? Now, Tom is wearing gloves um, on his right hand because he has tools in his hands and he's working sculpturally. So he's getting really close to all of that heat. So yes, a nice torch will help, uh, or a nice glove will help protect him from that heat. But if he tried to pick up that pipe and turn it, the dexterity would be taken away with that glove. So typically, you do not see glass workers wearing gloves if they are the one handling the pipe, unless it's a very thin, like grippy glove just to help them turn if it's really, really big. So you just learn to touch it in the right place and to not touch it where it's hot. That's really what it comes down to. So um, yes, those poles are made of metal. Yes, they do get hot, but they're stainless steel. So they dissipate their heat a lot better than, say, a copper pipe would. But yes, it's a... Um, a delicate balance and sometimes learning the hard way where to touch and where not to touch on a piece. All right, now as we're getting more and more complicated parts put together, this is where all that insurance policy needs to start coming into play. We're using these fluffy torches to continue to heat and spot heat the very delicate areas um, and any appendage that's sticking way out has a, a susceptibility to become too cold and like crack right on the surface. So as, as this gets more complicated, we're gonna see more and more use of those torches just to maintain heat rather than um, all the spot heating. The reheating chamber itself is great for giving a good general overall heat but if we leave it in there too long, all those parts start moving, all of them start to lose their texture and their detail, and so um, it's a really delicate balance. 
especially the punty connection at the back end. You can see she's kind of flashing the back of that punty. You don't want the punty to get too cold either, or it could fall off that punty. So torching the punty is really important when you have a big um, piece like this that is pretty much a wall that's blocking that punty from the heat when you go in. So they'll be doing a lot of uh, that heat maintenance. Could I see a hand over? You got a question? Oh. We've got a young lady here who has been counting eyeballs, and she says she only sees how many? 10. So she's wondering where the other 11 are. Well, I'll tell you, there's still parts to be put onto this piece. So I think that there's probably still quite a few of them in our pickup oven waiting to be put onto the piece. As you can see, um, our bird doesn't have a head yet. So there's at least two eyes there. Where the rest of them are, we'll have to see together because I'm not sure where all they're going to be hiding either. Um, but yes, we're going to be accumulating 21 eyes on this piece in its completion. Um, some of them, I think, are uh, the tires, and there's a couple on the side of the, uh, the bird. Here we've got a great picture of the image that we're working from. So there's two there. Uh, oh, they had the camera on it, actually, but I'll, I'll pull it out of your way. That's all right. We'll pull it out of your way here. So maybe, maybe you can help count them and see if you can figure out where, where they're missing from. One, two, three, four. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's some at the front, some at the back of the car, on the four tires. There's two on the side of the bird. There's some flowers at the top of the bird. There's two eyes for the bird itself. Two flowers on the back of the bird. Yeah, two, three flowers that still yet to be, have to be, or trees that are yet to be attached. And even one hidden over there, yeah. So that's where they're all at. They're still yet to come. We got a lot of parts yet to come in, but that's very observant. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, so there's the question. If they get tired, can they take a break, or do you really have to finish assembling the piece um, in its entirety? Now, as you can see, we've got lots of components. All those components are in that oven, saying stay for safe, warm, and happy. So in theory, we could take this piece, break it off, put it into an oven, let it rest, go take a break, and come back. But heating up an entire piece with all those complicated pieces runs a higher risk. That's one of the reasons why he has made um, smaller components that are now being assembled together. Because when you go to reheat everything together, that means that it's all the same temperature. So as soon as you go to flash, the smallest details will start to melt first, while the bigger details take a while to recover that heat. Where if you can start with it all on the pipe and keep everything warm, then you're going to have more of a core heat in that piece and working from the inside out. So um, in theory, yes, we could, but, but yeah, but at this point we wouldn't, you know. Um, yeah, so who's going to continue to build this piece um, bit by bit? Uh, and uh, if they're tired, tough noogies. That's just part of glass blowing. You just got to finish what you start and keep uh, toughing it out. They've actually been working really hard over the last couple of days, uh, and I'm sure this evening they'll, I, they will all have a great celebratory uh, relaxation after such an adventure here at the Corning Museum of Glass for the last couple of days. So anyone who's joined us uh, late in the process here, this is Tom Moore from Australia. He is our visiting artist this evening. Um, really coming together with an amazing, amazing piece. Uh, he's brought a very skilled and talented team with him this evening. Uh, we've got Sarah, Betty, Jonathan, and David uh, working uh, on helping put this whole piece together. And I think I didn't the image. So it looks like they're pulling a spout at the top of this, and I believe that is just going to be the opening at the top of that vessel, right? 
Yeah. <laughs> he gave me a sure, why not shrug. But all of these, um, this, this particular piece is um, influenced by a lot of the trick glasses that you'll see uh, examples of in our collection, but you can also see them in a lot of different museums. Um, and they were done at a couple different times in history, but one of the fun things about them is that they, they're very sculptural. They look very sculptural. A lot of times they're based on um, animals and such, but uh, there's usually a, a puzzle. It's basically a puzzle. You've got to figure out how to drink out of this vessel, but there might be a hole in one place and a valve in another and a, like a tube in another place. So you might have to like stop up one area with a finger and then pour something in the other direction. There's always this challenge of figuring out how to get the material or the liquid to flow through this um, vessel properly. And so um, as he's building this, uh, a lot of these parts are, are somewhat hollow. Um, I know the top section has a very uh, distinct trick glass approach. This vest, uh, the bird itself is hollow. So uh, you could also put liquid through there. It's poking holes in a lot of different places. But this is kind of a long um, traditional uh, form, um, those trick glasses. And probably the most common version of that that you might be familiar with is the German boot. So you have to drink a certain way and flip the boot at a certain time, otherwise the bubble will form and sploosh, glass, or sploosh beer all over you. So um, all of those uh, are built into the design of the piece, um, kind of assembling it to be a trick glass. Now, one of the things about working um, in this style and with this hot glass is, unfortunately, we don't really get a good look at the colors involved in this piece. Um, this has a full rainbow of colors added onto uh, all those different canes, all the different lines, all the little eyeballs, but none of them are gonna really look like themselves while the glass is hot. As you can see from the clear glass that we pull from our furnace, it reflects the high temperatures of that glass and glows bright orange. And colors also react to heat in a similar fashion. Sometimes they'll glow in a very unfamiliar color, um, reflecting that heat energy. But also they just sort of look different when they're hot. So greens or blues sometimes look green, and reds will end up looking brown. Oranges will look red. So it really depends on the color. Um, so uh, we do highly encourage everyone to check it out um, online, the images of this when it's complete. Um, to see all these beautiful colors that were um, kind of dawling out uh, tonight um, when, they're, when the glass is hot. We'll also, of course, encourage anyone who's out there to come and visit us here at the Corning Museum of Glass. We have some really exciting things happening here this summer. I can't believe it's August already. We're already uh, well into the summer and coming in uh, to the second half of summer. We've got some special demos happening here at the museum this summer. Uh, We've got our courtyard stages open and doing three very special demos, one called Bubble Heads, which is a great sculptural approach where you, our guests, get to help us design um, little characters out of glass. 
so uh, if you are inspired by uh, Tom's work here today and really want to be a uh, part of creating fun and exciting things out of glass, you can visit our courtyard stage for not only the bubble heads, but also our You Design It program. This is something that we've done here at the museum for, for years. Uh, and this summer, both the hot shop outside the courtyard stage and our flame working station in the innovations area are doing these You Design It's where um, when you come to visit, you can do an illustration uh, in something that you'd love to see made out of glass. And then we choose uh, one of those illustrations to make an object every single day. So we're making at least two of those today, uh, every day, one in the outside shop and one in the inside flame working shop. We also have our uh, new Glass Now exhibition that has been up and running for a few months now, showing you uh, new and exciting ways of looking at glass as a material. Uh, anyone here taking a chance to see that show today? Fantastic. Well, if you haven't, don't worry. Uh, that's up. There's plenty of time left. You can go up uh, into the contemporary wing and take a look at that exhibition. You can also find a lot of images of that online as well, of course, if you are um, joining us from far and wide. Uh, check out the social media. There's been a lot of coverage uh, for that particular exhibition. Um, but really forming glass, just like Tom here, really looking at tradition and this uh, traditional material, but taking it into new and exciting places, making uh, a wide variety of creative approaches uh, to glass making. So there we go, the top of our bird head. Again, a really great demonstration of understanding how glass moves and being able to set up very specific uh, situations to get that beak to pull out as it was, or at least the contact tip of the beak. I think he might have additional glass that's added to that. Yes, in the image, there's a really long black uh, beak that's going to be added, but he still needed to create the foundation for that. Kayla's right on the visuals there for the image. Thank you so much for that. So it looks like he's separating that out into two little sections. Um, I personally really do love working glass sculpturally as well, so it's always fun to have uh, artists come and do demonstrations because you can watch how they approach that material and pick up little, little uh, pro tips, little tweaks to, to uh, design. I'm always learning something new every time I work with glass and every time I watch someone else work with glass. Most of the folks on the floor here have, have worked with uh, either university or public access studios. And public access studios especially are really fantastic. Um, that's a, a great opportunity for anyone who's interested in working with glass to take an opportunity to take a class, take a workshop. Of course, we have a full range of opportunities here at our museum, the Corning Museum of Glass. Um, but as they mentioned, we've got folks from Pittsburgh Glass Center, from the Chrysler Museum, um, from uh, the Jam Factory there in Australia. All of those are going to offer opportunities for people to have access to this wonderful material and try it out. And really, glass making takes years of dedication to make this kind of uh, professional level, but you can make some really fun and exciting things in just a short amount of time, especially taking workshops uh, with other uh, skilled artists to help you in some of those tricky parts like gathering. What are we making here? Oh, is this the beak? Nice. So this wasn't a part that was made already. He's developing uh, that beak nice and hot. So a bit of dark glass. Looks like we're going for that one again.
Now we do have little chips of broken glass we call frit that's in the little bowl here on the table. And I'm, I'm glad they're making some of these components in front of you folks so you can see how this kind of stuff comes together. Um, most of these uh, lines and things that you see were made with solid color, colored glass. But a lot of these little components, um, you don't want to use solid glass color. You just coat the surface of the clear with little chips of broken gl colored glass. So then they give the illusion of being a solid um, object. And so adding a little bit to the surface, it's made of glass, so it melts in very easily. And uh, I think that's probably a black that they use, but it's a little hard for me to tell from here. But uh, all of the different colors come from the addition of metallic oxides into those uh, raw materials of glass. So black glass is actually a very dark purple glass using manganese. <laughs> How much do the raw materials cost? You know, I actually haven't had to buy any of those raw materials lately, but um, I will tell you one thing, that when you're looking at glass color versus clear glass, there's a significant difference in price. So the clear glass, uh, you're either going to get what's called batch or you're gonna get cullet. Batch is all those raw materials, the silica, the soda ash, the limestone, the other little bits and pieces that make it the kind of glass that it is. And when you're buying batch, um, the you're, you have to also melt that in your furnace and then uh, use more gas and more time to melt that than if you get cullet, which is pre-made glass that you're um, melting down. So the cost per pound, it really doesn't account for the cost of energy it takes to melt that glass. Look at that beautiful job on the beak there. Very nice. Um, but to order clear glass, you're looking at um, a few dollars a pound, depending on the glass. Um, but when you start looking at the colored glass, um, you're looking at metallic oxides and compounds. So if I'm looking at green glass, that's iron added into it. So that's fairly inexpensive, but that's, I would say, in a range of 20 to $30 a kilo for kind of lower um, in green. And then you look at the pink glass. Pink glass uses gold chloride. So those are getting up to like $70 a kilo for the pink glass. So depending on the metals, depending on the materials, depending on what form you're buying it in, um, we buy all of our color pre-made. And it comes either in um, solid bar form or you can get it in like pea gravel down to smaller little chunks down to powder. So you pay a premium for powder because they have to further crush it where the bigger chunks they're a little cheaper, so there's also a premium on the version of glass that you get as well. Yeah. All right, so he set that up beautifully to contact the two sides of that peak, pulled it out into a nice tall taper, but now it looks like he's going to cut it down just a little bit more to refine that peak, the, the tip of the beak, just a little bit. This is where I think some of the challenge in, in sculpture really comes in, because once you've removed a certain amount of glass, it's hard to put it back without it being lumpy. And if you've heated a glass and tried to give it this beautiful transition, you saw how evenly it pulled out into that tall peak. By reheating that glass, you're really creating unevenness. And so um, it's really difficult to get a, a refinement of that peak without getting almost like two angles going in that peak. So this really shows his uh, experience as a glassmaker. I think they said 18 years of glassmaking experience to really see uh, and understand how to let that glass heat and move and to get those final shapes that you're looking for. This continued uh, flash heating of the piece, of course, is very necessary to keep the balance of temperatures. 
Um, we also have different doors on that furnace. We're using all gas-fired um, equipment here on the amphitheater stage, but you can also work with electric equipment. There's that tricky move of using the cane as a little punty to grab those little pieces out of the pickup box and sticking it right to the side of that head. But we have different door sizes on our furnace as well. Um, I can already see the glow of the furnace is a little bit less than it was when we started. So you're constantly kind of losing heat in that equipment as you're um, working, and especially as you open and close all of those doors. So uh, Benjamin is keeping a quick eye on the doors there, making sure that they stay uh, closed as much as possible to conserve some of that temperature. There's always questions about, well, how long do you know, or how do you know how long to heat a piece or to not heat a piece? Um, and really that comes through years of experience. Because as you can see, the temperature of the furnace changes throughout the course of a working of a piece. And so um, your sense of timing also has to shift in conjunction with that change in temperature. And different glasses act differently in the heat. Uh, soft colors like dark blacks and blues, those are gonna keep their heat and soften up really quickly, where light colors like the, the white in that bird and some other, the, the, the paler colors, those are gonna be a little more stiff. So uh, even the temperatures between those two can be different. So you just have to really have a basic understanding through experience. And all of us here, all the glass workers here have probably broken more glass than we'd like to talk about in that pursuit of learning that sense of timing. But you generally get a sixth sense you just start getting this uh, twitch that makes you feel like you've just been out of the heat too long, and there's only so much a torch or other tools can help you acclimate it. You really have to keep that core heat going. You got a question, sorry. All right, so we had a question here. Do we put silica in our furnace? Um, so here at the Corning Museum of Glass, we don't use batch, we actually use cullet. So cullet is um, already pre-melted glass. And uh, those of you that are here in-house, I can show you this visual, but um, this is what our glass looks like. It's little chunks. So the manufacturer takes the raw materials of glass, the silica and soda ash and limestone, and melt it for us and then give us these little chips. And when you're working with the batch itself, it takes longer to get it to heat and melt and turn into glass and refine. It can take almost 24 hours to get a really nice glass to form out of that. And it takes higher temperatures and longer time. So it's a little bit more expensive um, to melt that glass from that raw material. Um, but it also is a powder. And powders, uh, silica in particular, can be hazardous to your health. So you need to make sure you protect yourself with uh, proper uh, PPE and everything. So um, we end up getting that pre-melted glass also for safety. So it makes it a lot easier for us to use. But, um, but yes, ours is filled with the little chips and any of the clear recycling. You can see uh, Michael just grabbed a little chunk of clear glass that had been cut free from the thing and he put it into the bucket there by the furnace. So all of that clear glass that's uh, kept clean can be put back into our furnace as well. So we recycle as much glass as possible um, to, again, try to reuse as much of that material as possible. Glass, in theory, is infinitely remeltable as long as it's compatible with itself. Different formulas will, of course, all melt, but they may not shrink at the same rate as they cool. So you have to separate very specific um, glass formulas and melt those together rather than mix and match a bunch of random types of glass. Yeah. All right, so adding some extra little bits. I think some of these are going to be anchor points uh, for additional bits of decoration that uh, are still yet in our oven waiting to be added to the piece. I'm getting a nod that that's correct, yep. I think I saw there was, there's like three trees coming out of the 
back, so this must be the foundation for those trees. Oh, it's the handles. Oh, perfect, perfect. But every single bit of glass that's put onto this piece is well thought out. You can see from the illustration we've got a game plan, but even the bits themselves, we call that bit working, when you're taking gobs of glass and delivering it to the gaffer to make additions. But every little bit of glass has to be shaped a certain way and um, uh, cooled a certain way, heated a certain way. All of these perfect conditions set up in that little blob of glass to get it to do what you want once it's on the piece. And even getting down to the point of which tool to choose, because you can see there's lots of toys and tools on the bench to play with, but uh, you also um, need to make sure that, uh, that you are using the appropriate tool to cut that glass. They're just shielding the piece from splattering water. Right now, they're just cooling that pipe to make it a little easier uh, for him to hold onto it. Those pipes do end up getting pretty hot, especially after working on a piece for such amount of time and reheating in that furnace and everything. Those pipes do get pretty warm. And the closer he can hold to the piece, the more ergonomic it is. So you want to be able to keep that pipe nice and cool. So we got a really nice pipe cooler here to help it out. But even a little splash of water or a drip of sweat can cause a crack to form. So you got to be really careful about not letting anything fall on the piece. But as he's cutting all of these bits free, um, we've got two basic forms of tools. Uh, I'll grab a few so we can talk a little bit about tools. So it looks like we're adding some little dots. These are just using those same little rods that um, he could use for a cane or marini and just spot heating little teeny dots as decoration along that form. But we've got two main categories of shears that we can use. Generally, we have straight shears or diamond shears. Straight shears come in different sizes and shapes. If I'm making really delicate sculpture, I might want really long, thin blades that I can get into tight little spots. If I have big glass to cut, I'm going to choose those bigger, heavier glass tools. But as I cut that glass, if I cut a bit across it, I'm going to flatten it as I cut it. So it's going to turn into a square-ended bit. If I cut at an angle, I'm going to create a point out of that same bit. And then that little point can be pulled even further. Now, it does leave a cold chill mark along the sheared area of that um, glass. So I have to think ahead on what my final shape I want it to be. So you can kind of predict. If I pull, if I cut up, I make it really pointy. If I cut down, I can compress the glass as I work. So a lot of details, even into the kind of shear that you use in that detail. Now the diamond shears, these are not made of diamond. They get their name from that diamond shape in the center. And it's a very unique tool, I think, only to glass make. I don't think I've ever seen a pair of round scissors like this. But as you narrow down on that glass, it's catching it from all sides and creating a round bit. So if you're cutting a round uh, piece of glass and you want to keep it round, you're going to choose those diamond shears to help that happen. But anytime you're touching metal to glass, it chills the glass. So that creates a certain lump. So you have to plan ahead for all those little contingencies. There's also a little holding spot on the tip of these diamond shears, so we can use these to grab hold of pipes and move things around as well. Is that a tiny little bottle I see? All right, so our bird is getting a bit of beverage here. A little drinking and driving, it looks like. So a tiny little vessel put right onto the roof of the car. And these are all things that you had torch worked yesterday, right? Oh, you made that at the Glory Hall? Oh, man. <laughs> OK. Too hard. It's too tiny. Just not a very good flame worker. All right, well, to each his own. Absolutely. You look like a skilled furnace worker, so absolutely. You got a lot of really nice parts. But he said he tried to make this on the torch, didn't really work out, so he worked it on the furnace. And to make a tiny bottle like that in the furnace is actually quite difficult. Because as you can see, those reheating chambers are pretty broad heat. 
So I know when I was a beginner and I started out, I always thought, well, if I make something tiny, it'll be easier. I can carry it around easier. It's a little easier to control. That is definitely not true. You work super tiny, then your tolerances of where those heat zones are are compressed into such a small area, it's really hard to design. All right, so Tom has said that he actually does a lot of torturing. A lot of these little components that you see were actually um, done in the flame. He does a lot of solid working with flame working. But he says that the, uh, whenever he goes, approaches hollow work, generally he gravitates towards uh, the blowpipe and to the furnace and to the liquid glass. Torch working usually is tubes and rods introduced into that flame to create objects. And uh, it's, it's somewhat rare to find an artist who is uh, an expert in both fields. Generally, people will focus in one area versus another. Obviously, he's a very diversified uh, glass maker and knows how to work on both, but um, we all end up gravitating to where our comfort level is in making pieces. So he says, I really love whenever I'm working hollow, I gravitate right towards the furnace using small pipes and make really beautiful things um, using that hollow glass. Now, we were talking a little bit earlier about all these grabbers that um, are used. This looks almost like a medical. Cheetles? All right. <laughs> $6 on eBay, free delivery. Everybody's going to own their own pair of Cheetles now. Cheetle forceps. OK. Yeah, they do look like uh, medical tools. Again, again looking from the creative perspective, when looking at objects, uh, you can acclimate them into any number of applications. So I think uh, having that uh, f flexibility to really look past a certain function, especially in glass making, um, if, if you always gravitate towards glass only being used in a certain way, you're never really going to push forward in uh, that creativity. So stepping outside of that uh, understood norm and uh, approaching in new ways, you can find new use. Put a bird on it, he says. So those are some great tongs to grab hold of all these little teeny tiny pieces. I think that is one of the challenges. Um, to You can make all the little amazing parts in the world, but if you can't pick them up and put them onto the piece, it's not going to really help you. So I believe this is another little bird. But look at all the detail in all of these little components. Again, each one of these little pieces were either a piece of cane that had to be pulled and then chopped up and then picked up and put into the heat and reformed into all the textures and the designs and the shapes that you see. So hours and hours and hours of work coming together to make this Tom Moore um, masterpiece. Also, see, they are keeping their picture down there, their illustration for reference, uh, especially with so many different parts and pieces. Uh, there, it really helps to have a map to figure out what's the next step, what's the ne next part that you're going to grab. And the sequence of this assemblage is also really important because if you start putting on the little details and then go for the big details, you're going to end up losing all your little details. So you're kind of building it from uh, the broad strokes down to the small strokes. Now you might notice as well that he's been actually warming up those uh, cheetles there uh, before he grabs hold of glass. Um, when you're working with vessels or objects or little pieces out of that pickup box, um, a, just like a tiny bit of water can cause thermal shock or a tiny bit of sweat, a little cold steel can be the disaster of a piece. So making sure those tongs are warmed up so they're not shocking those pieces. 
They may hold together. They may not fall apart, but it'll set a little kind of a memory into that piece, and that might crack at a later time what, because of that little stress. All this detail work is one of the things that I find the most amazing about his work. Uh, Tom has put a lot of thought into all of this character and uh, all these different little components. But when you start to add all these little details, it adds so much language into uh, the communication that you're um, really trying to express creatively. Uh, 7.45. Oh, no. <laughs> Nothing like working under a time limit. It's always tricky making big pieces like this because you, again, have a theory on how long it'll take to assemblage, but to actually put things together, there's a lot of factors that come into it. You know, maybe you needed to take that extra heat to make sure that one part of it is uh, hot enough, or maybe you need to uh, take a little time to reassess a particular component. There were spot heating some of the little tree flowers that go onto the top. So we're not trying to rush anybody, but I do want to let you know that when the museum closes at 8 o'clock, you're welcome to hang out and continue to watch, but we'll have to exit out this one particular area. So if there's any other thing in the museum that you wanted to see, now's your chance, because we're going to be filtering you out um, only in this lower level um, at 8 o'clock, uh, or after, whenever he finishes this piece, if it goes past 8 o'clock. But we just want to warn you for that. Um, but definitely hang out and keep watching as we're finishing up our piece here. So this is why this is really coming down to some of those final details, all those little pieces. Um, you can see the glow from that last contact joint. Uh, that'll keep its heat for a little while. So uh, even as it's being reheated, it's a, it's a, a delicate balance turning the piece making sure those, that last little bit doesn't somehow fall uh, over because it's still really hot. So the more bits and pieces that are added, the more complicated Jonathan's uh, job gets as this piece is being um, assembled. Now I do notice that a lot of the pieces are still a little flexible. so. Um, He's being really smart, keeping it just a little bit hot so that there's just a little bit movement of movement in that piece.
And I know I mentioned this earlier, but I really, I really love that there's so much solid, clear glass in this car. <clears throat> because one of the things that's really fun about using color in glass and using thick glass is the way that, uh, of course, light transmits through it. But when you have thick glass, it actually amplifies things, makes it look bigger. So having all these little stripes on the underbelly of that car, but we don't really look at the car from the underneath. We're looking at it from the top side. And so uh, all this uh, thick glass is amplifying those little stripes and making them seem larger than life on the inside and reflecting color up through the entire piece because of um, those reflective qualities. So it's a really interesting um, approach uh, to technique of glass to decide whether the color is going to be on the inside or the outside of a thick piece. Um, the way that you stack things really makes a difference. You've got transparent glass, you have opaque glass, and as you marry those on top of each other, you get illusions of third colors, because glass doesn't really mix together like paint, but it will mix optically. So if you're putting two transparent colors over top of each other, you're going to get um, a, 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 a third transparent color. But if you put a transparent over an opaque, sometimes that underlying opaque, say if it's white, then it can make that transparent pop even more so than what it would on its own. So a lot of that uh, thought process goes into the design of work. And I think it's something that's very unique to glass as well, um, because most things in life aren't transparent. So if you're looking at ceramics, you know, you're really looking at color on the surface of glass or of, on the ceramic. And so you have that extra dimension to play with when you're looking at designing work out of glass. Even down to the, fi the finite little details, like the wings or the little petals of the flowers, I can see that he's using multiple colors to create that variegation, to create that depth in the work, and uh, all of that co comes together to be a very kind of playful and uh, thoughtful approach to color and design. Any other questions or curiosities that you folks have with us? Yes, sir. Do we keep our furnaces on at night or turn them off? So um, the reheating chambers that we're working out of. Sorry about that. And as a request for some uh, additional grabbers. So um, our furnaces, uh, the, the one that holds the glass does need to be kept hot all the time. Um, it takes almost a week to get a furnace up to temperature, full of glass and ready to go. And if it were to crash um, as that glass cools, if it was full of glass, that glass would harden and shrink and start to pull apart the furnace itself. So it's, it's very important to not give it a lot of up and down swing when it has all that glass. Now the, the reheating chambers, there's no glass inside of there, so those get shut off every night and we, it only takes like about an hour to two hours to bring them back to temperature in the morning. Yeah, this furnace was turned on in 2015 when we opened this wing and has not been turned off since. So they will last anywhere from uh, five to 15 years depending on the type of furnace, but um, the glass is very corrosive so the second you flip on that switch and you turn on that fire and you start melting glass in it, it starts eating itself. So the glass is melting away the, the crucible inside that holds all of that glass. The sill is starting to be eaten away. So eventually we will need to turn it off to do repairs, replace that inner liner that holds all the glass, maybe rebuild the sill a little bit. But for now, it's holding like a champ. So we won't, I don't foresee that being anytime um, soon. Yeah. Good question. Oh, good. So we found the grabbers. These are another um, kind of augmented tool um, that become very popular in, for glass makers. They're actually like a pair of uh, kitchen tongs, and then they add a little bent um, section to the tip to create a three-prong uh, grabber. I think these are actually, uh, are these? 
I believe, I believe these are Jason Johnson tongs, so I want to give a shout out to Jason Johnson, one of the amazing glass worker and uh, tool maker out in Seattle area in upstate Washington. Um, but he makes a lot of really unique tools um, because him and uh, Karen Wundbreak, they work together to make a lot of really amazing glass sculptural things. And again, when you don't have the tools to make what you want, you make your own tools. And so he has developed um, a, a whole line of very unique uh, pieces or tools uh, to be able to make sculpture with. So here we go, that top section of the trick top or the trick glink drinking glass. Uh, if you remember some of the images that we saw earlier in the program there, you can see some of the connections between this little addition and some of those historically referenced pieces um, that inspire Tom and his work. Beautiful job. Yeah, 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 we can give him a big round of applause. Coming together, it's coming together. It's fantastic. Now this is all um, clear glass that he's added, but it still has a couple little connections, and I believe our little girl who was counting eyeballs has left, but hopefully uh, by the end of this piece, we can count all 21 eyeballs on there, and this cup definitely has a little eyeball on it as well. I'm sorry? You know, I I'm sorry, with all the torches, the cooling down process, yes, absolutely. So um, as glass cools, it shrinks, so you need to let it shr shrink evenly and under controlled conditions. Now that shrinking process, um, it depends on the type of glass that it is. Ours is a soda lime glass, so it has a pretty big expansion contraction. If you're looking at borosilicate glass, it is formulated to not have a big expansion contraction. So you can throw a Bunsen burner on it or you can throw it from your oven to your refrigerator and it won't crack. So for this glass, um, it does need to be cooled slowly. So we have um, boxes on the, both sides of the stage. These are called annealing ovens. And um, to anneal glass, you cool it slow enough so that it's uh, little parts, it's big parts, it's thin, it's thick, it's outside, it's inside, all cool and shrink at the same rate. That way it avoids that stress and cracks. So, um, and that rate of cooling is based on the thickness of the glass, um, not the size of the glass. So if we made a big bubble about Tom's size, but it was hollow, it would cool much faster than if we made something solid like his foot or his hand or any other no, thing, solid chunk. So we need to make sure to calculate um, the thickness of the work when we plan how long we take to cool it. And we also need to calculate maybe how complicated a piece is. When you're looking at certain shapes, certain connections, all of those will also automatically be more stress-inducing than others. And so a very complicated piece like this with all these different parts and connections will give it extra time, not only based on the thickest part, but just to allow it to cool and hopefully survive that shrinking. So I'm guessing this one will be at least a 24-hour cycle, if not longer, um, but he hasn't told us how long it's gonna be cooling yet, so we'll have to answer that question after we put it away in our oven. Most of the average pieces that you see down here on the stage, all of our daily demonstration programs, um, those are generally an overnight process. You can come back the next day and see one of the objects that we've seen made. Um, as I said, this will probably be a day or two before we come at, um, get it out. And also, um, we will document it. Um, it will take pictures. We'll put it onto our uh, social media, onto our website. Um, so you'll be able to see this final piece in its glorious colors once it's down to room temperature in a few days. Um, also keep an eye on that social media. Of course, we've got a few more visiting artists um, and live streams coming up on those Thursday evenings at 6. Uh, the studio every uh, Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon also does live streaming. So you can watch um, glass blowing and glass forming, uh, torch work, all sorts of different kinds of demonstrations uh, throughout the summer. Um, there and then we archive them eventually all on our YouTube channel So if you have a particular artist that you didn't get a chance to see um, Or if you have a particular technique that you want to check out 
you can reference that entire collection um, on the, the website or on our YouTube channel as well. If uh, Corning's known for anything else, it's good social media for sure. We try to document everything that's happening here and make sure that everyone gets an opportunity to really be a part of the exciting things that are happening. Um, because of course there are so many exciting things happening at the Corning Museum of Glass. What's that? The time is 7.59. <laughs> How, how's your time going? You're pretty close. Well, take your time. Do what needs to be done. No need to rush. And like I said, those of you who are sitting here, don't worry. You can stay with us to watch the rest of the show, the rest of the assemblage. And of course, online, you're just nice and comfy wherever you're sitting. So hopefully, you've made yourself comfortable and you can continue to watch as well, um, but we won't kick anybody out at 8 o'clock. We just can't let you go anywhere else in the museum. So, <laughs> so we'll just <laughs> file you out accordingly to make sure um, you can visit. We're going to put it in this lower oven here, and we have a piece of fiber frax in there ready for you. Well, the base is a kiln shelf. All right, so a little discussion on how this piece is going to be loaded into the oven. Uh, we really want to make sure that there's enough space. So we're going to put a couple kiln shelves in there. And that way, it can sit on these kiln shelves and give uh, the wheels a nice steady place to sit with a little space to make sure that the putty doesn't um, keep it from sitting flat. The bottom of this piece, that punny connection that is in on that piece, um, will be severed, but it'll leave a chunk of glass. This is another one of those insurance policies that we've built into the piece. Instead of breaking the connection at the piece and running the risk of breaking into the piece itself, there's a, a jack line or a squeeze line put in between about halfway in that punny. So when we go to break it free, there'll be a little chunk left, and that'll be cold worked off later. So that is just another way of making sure that the piece uh, is um, kept as one piece and not losing any of that beautiful color that's on the bottom of the, the, the vessel. So I think we are coming in on some final moments. So I just want to give another uh, shout out to all of our uh, team here tonight. Uh, we've got, of course, Sarah Vaughn's been helping out uh, tonight with a lot of parts, components, torch work. Uh, David King as well. He's got the torch right now helping maintain. Uh, Jonathan um, Bolivar has been doing a lot of the uh, heating here tonight. And uh, Betty Gowan really keeping an eye on the back end of the pipe, all the parts and components, keeping the glue of everything um, going and flowing. Uh, Benjamin here is our intern this summer, and he's been doing a fantastic job here at Seamog uh, throughout the summer. He'll be heading back uh, to Detroit here soon. And he's been manning the doors and helping keep things together. Michael Beam's getting all dressed up in the magic suit here to help protect him from the intense heat of holding this piece and loading it into the oven as well. We also have the amazing uh, um, 
visual team here that's working all the cameras on. Brad is on camera. Amanda's been answering all your questions online and is, of course, going to be taking pictures and showing you all these things on the social media. So she is responsible for all of those um, fantastic things you're seeing online. Kayla's been manning the cameras upstairs doing a great job showing you all the unique views of this wonderful piece as it comes together. And of course, the one and the only, Tom Moore here leading the team, making this beautiful piece. So excited to have him with us here uh, this week, making all of the parts and pieces for this final assemblage. Check out his work online, of course. He is uh, in Australia. I think he's traveling a bit um, this summer here in the United States. Uh, so you might be able to catch up with him here, but we're really excited to have him here for a couple of days with us. So he's kind of um, chomping away a little bit at that uh, connection, making sure that there's a weak spot. Glass breaks wherever it is the weakness, so we always put in all of these constrictions, these weaknesses, to make sure that's where the glass breaks. Continuing to torch, balancing out those temperatures. Don't want any one little part to get too cold. Like I said, there'd be some really fun visuals on the inside of that reheating chamber throughout this process. That is an amazing, amazing piece. I can't wait to see this uh, when it's all cold in its brilliant colors. Couple final tweaks. It's no need to put it away until it's perfect. You want to make sure everything's in the right piece and right in the right place and also the right temperature. If anything's too hot and we go to put it away, it could shift a little bit. So you always want to make sure that your work is loaded away into the oven at a temperature where it's not moving around. So you get out what you put in. There we get our final look. <laughs> a little discussion there, making sure he's got a good hold on it. There we go. Let's give it up for Tom Moore and the team. Beautiful job. Away in the oven. Oh, just tall enough. And it sits on those wheels. Fantastic. I want to thank everyone for tuning in online and joining us here in-house. This is a really exciting piece. Keep an eye on that social media to see the final look of that piece. But thank you so much, Tom, and all the team.